So good afternoon. My name is Giannis Nikolakopoulos. I work at, uh, I'm a software engineer at Zero Point Technologies and leading the software team there. And today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some of the work we do together with the team uh, on hardware accelerated memory compression in Linux. So allow me a little bit of shameless marketing in the beginning just to bring in some context and to so that I justify why we do what we do. And I'll start by the, the energy challenge that we have nowadays. I mean, our broader ICT sector is the fastest growing energy consumer industry. Um, in the beginning of the decade, we were consuming, data centers were consuming basically 2% of their electricity globally. And that's expected to grow fivefold until the end of the decade. Uh, we also have more than 5 billion smart devices, which all of them add up to a significant energy footprint. And the pain points we hear from our customers is that memory capacity is a limitation. This can be either due to the because of the form factor or pure cost. Uh, memory bandwidth is a limitation because of the usual memory wall between CPU and the memory and of course system power consumption. So for example, in Memcon this year, we heard from Google Cloud that performance and total cost of ownership is super important, and the biggest technical challenge today is system power. So our research shows that up to 70% of the memory content is actually re redundant in most systems. And with our technology, we can deliver up to 50% uh, more performance per watt by removing this redundant content. So the technology we develop uh, consists of three pillars. Uh, the first part is the data compression algorithms. So these are implemented in hardware and they are ultra fast, high performance and low latency. Uh, summarizing a vast family of results, we can say that the we are talking about roughly 2 to 4 to, uh, 2x to 4x compression ratios uh, using general purpose and lossless compression. And the compression operates on cast line granularity. Then on the side of this, we have the data compaction algorithms because it's not enough to compress the data to start getting benefits. It depends on how and where you compact them. Uh, so again, we are talking about uh, Hardware implemented algorithms there uh, that provide real time uh, performance, high performance, and low latency. And they actually have dynamic compaction and granularity depending on the use cases we have. And last but not least, uh, the memory, ma the software to integrate all this into the system. Uh, so there is uh, memory ma different memory management techniques that we use. We basically try to be as transparent to the operating system as possible. Uh, and we have, again, a lot of hardware acceleration uh, to achieve that. Now, I understand all these are pretty generic. Uh, and there are actually different ways that we can package uh, this technology, uh, which leads to different product lines. Uh, the market segments we focus are data centers and smart devices at the moment. And I'll give a very high level overview of the product lines we have, and I'll focus on two of them uh, and how we integrate them in, we integrate them in Linux today. So as I said, the technology is uh, quite generic, and it, it can be applied basically anywhere from CAS to main memory, even down to storage. Uh, one example is the Zeptilion bandwidth. So there we integrate the technology on the system on chip before the memory controller. And the purpose is to achieve bandwidth acceleration and tackle the, uh, the memory bandwidth problem. Uh, similarly, it can be integrated even into the CAS. Uh, and that's actually getting more and more important because today's technology nodes, uh, in, today in the re most recent technology nodes, the SRAM is not scaling anymore. Uh, then we have SuperAM, uh, which is, in a nutshell, hardware acceleration for ZRAM and ZSwap. Uh, and that's actually taped out, and we are currently integrating this. 
and it's one of the products that we'll talk about. And DanceMem, which is the way we see integrating in the technology behind CXL devices in order to further increase the memory capacity. Uh, so I, I will talk more about this, and I think uh, Jürgen's talk was an excellent segue. Uh, to Finally, there is also an encryption IP uh, that is actually not just taped out, but out in the market uh, in the product. Uh, where we basically accelerate uh, encryption and decryption of data that reside in memory. And the vision is that in the future we will actually combine these two technologies together. So, let me jump into uh, SuperAMP first, uh, because it's a good example of some of the characteristics of the technology we have. So, in a nutshell, SuperAMP is a hardware software code design uh, that compresses and decompresses memory pages on demand. The compression and decompression uh, happens in hardware, and it's actually triggered by Linux commands. And by Linux here, in fact, we mean integrating directly with ZRAM. Uh, and the driver for this, uh, we plan to upstream after we finish the product integration. Uh, so this is a pretty good uh, venue for us to start getting feedback uh, on the things we're doing. The characteristics uh, of the product in this case is that we're talking about 5 to 10x uh, higher throughput than what you would get uh, using software compression algorithms like LZ4. Uh, and reasonably high compression efficiency. On average, we can say 2x compression ratios. So the value proposition is that by using our hardware, we can offload the functionality that the ZDRAM does in the CPU into the accelerator. So better user experience, more CPU time available, uh, and more, more energy efficient compression, actually, than the usual uh, ZDRAM operation. So how is this integrated? And let me do a very quick and high-level view of uh, the baseline ZDRAM, uh, in case you're not aware. So ZDRAM in general is uh, it's, it's a block device uh, which stores data in memory in a compressed form. And it's widely used as a swap target. Uh, I mean, it's a block device. It can be used for anything, but it's one of the most common use cases. Uh, so in a typical swap out path, I mean, the memory reclamation path of the kernel will pick up uh, a page frame, send it to the block device uh, to be swapped out. And then what ZDRAM is doing in that case is it's actually calling this uh, crypto compression API, crypto comp API, which on the back end, it can have multiple software algorithms. It might be LZ4, LZO, Z standard, depending on how it is configured. Uh, compresses the data, and then when it, when it's, once it has the, the compressed blob, it will call uh, zsmalloc, uh, which is just a compressed memory allocator, so that it finds a place in memory where it can store it and uh, compact them together. Uh, similarly, on the swapping path, it's the reverse process. Picks out the data wherever it was stored, runs it through the software decompression, and pulls it back to memory. Uh, so, in principle, the basic integration point, you can almost guess it. It's basically just replacing the, soft the part of the CryptoComp API that runs the software algorithm to actually talk to our accelerator and compress and decompress there. Uh, on the chip side, uh, SuperAM is essentially another master on the, on the SOC memory bus. Uh, so it's pretty easy to handle, there are no significant caching issues or anything like that. And to give slightly more details, our accelerator actually exposes multiple uh, physical interfaces so that it can support multiple compression and decompression commands uh, in flight at the same time. Uh, so all these are basically exposed as a CryptoComp algorithm 
from the driver. Uh, and then ZDRAM, which actually runs with uh, uh, one, ZDRAM usually runs with one uh, compression engine uh, per CPU, will call the multiple physical interfaces. Uh, ideally, it's one-to-one -one mapping. If there are more CPUs on the system, we'll, of course, have to arbitrate there. So I think so far so good. It looks pretty simple. But it's not the whole picture yet. And what I th would like to dive in now is some of the uh, characteristics of our compression algorithms. So this first generation of SuperRAM relies on, uh, stati on a, on a statistical-based compression uh, technology. So what does this mean? It means that the compression itself is stateful. So we have a, uh, there is a state that is established in the compression and decompressor, which is basically the encoding that the compressor and the decompressor have. And this encoding is generated either offline by having some data and offline we generate an encoding and we have it in advance, or even with online training within memory data. Uh, and this is actually hardware supported. So, which gives us the opportunity to adapt to possible data changes over time and produce new encodings that will improve the compression ratio performance. And I should say at this point that we actually have a wide portfolio of compression algorithms. This is one of them. Uh, and in upcoming generations, we expect uh, more of them to be used. And some of them are, are even stateless. So different techniques could apply there. Now, given that now we have this opportunity of improving uh, our encodings and improve the compression ratio, that means we actually have to we do a continuous compression ratio monitoring to monitor the system and understand how it is behaving. And occasionally, we also do training. We analyze memory data in the hardware and decide when, whenever we need to retrain the compression and deploy a new encoding. Uh, and we, of course, always evaluate whether we really need to do it or not. So something closer to the real picture looks like that. We have our hardware software interface on top of the accelerator, our SuperAMP driver in the kernel space, which, as I first said, it exposes a CryptoComp API which is how ZDRAM is talking to the driver. And this is really the critical path. This is all uh, where all the fast stuff need to happen. And then we expose some CSFS statistics uh, into, user into the user space that are useful for monitoring and for understanding how the compression ratio uh, is in the system and how our IP is behaving. Uh, and in addition to that, we have also a a random sampling mechanism implemented in the driver. So that's basically a, a, pretty, a, a simple, small random walk in anonymous pages, which we then analyze by, uh, with, the with the help of the data. It's not like that the CPU is accessing this. Uh, it's hardware accelerated how th this kind of analysis. And this analysis produces some metadata, which we then pass through uh, pass the user space so that we can generate a new encoding, evaluate it to see if it's worth it, and when we think that it's worth it, then resend it back to the driver so that, it's prog uh, that it programs the hardware. Uh, so we basically have also a user space tool that monitors the compression ratio, uh, drives the sampling in with respect to how often we sample and how big should be the sample size, and generates new encodings and passes them uh, to the hardware whenever needed. And for all these three parts, uh, like sampling, uh, uh, metadata reading, and passing the new encoding, we have an iOctal interface uh, on the driver. Now, there is also, th there is, however, a challenge uh, in all this. and. 
is that the hardware can transparently support up to a limited number of encodings. Uh, I mean, it's hardware, there are limited resources. We can support actually multiple encodings at the same time, but at some point we will need to phase out some of the older encodings. And of course, in order to phase out the encoding, we need to make sure that uh, no page exists that has been compressed without encoding. And in order to tackle this, we think that the best way is to uh, actually expose, uh, to get access to where the compressed data are placed, which means that we will need to modify the compressed memory allocator. So we are actually working uh, right now on uh, ZS malloc paths that would expose an interface for getting access to uh, the data from ZDRAM and from our driver. So that then can driver can go uh, to the original data, transcode it with a new encoding. Uh, and of course, a new encoding means that the size might change. So we might have to actually migrate the data within ZDRAM. Uh, so there is uh, sort of gotcha there. Uh, but still, it's something that we think can work and we're planning to try to upstream this. Other challenges uh, that we see, but we're not working on them right away, is that ZDRAM, uh, as it is right now, it's, it enforces a synchronous compression API. Um, because of the way it, it is architected, basically every CPU uh, disables preemption and you need to finish at the same time. However, from, uh, from our point of view, we believe that in future hardware, gen hardware generations we could achieve much higher throughput if we had a more asynchronous batch interface, sort of like the I.O. Euring style. Uh, so this is something that we could be interested to look into uh, in the future. All right. And switching gears, uh, let me talk a little bit now about Densmem, which is the other product line where we are working on. And it's how we believe we can integrate hardware accelerated memory compression and memory management uh, for CXL-based memory devices. Uh, so I will, it was really an excellent uh, segue from Jürgen, so I'll uh, rehash some of the information that you heard. Uh, so why CXL, uh, as we already saw, I, w I would summarize it that, yeah, besides heterogeneous computer that computing that we already have, we are leaning, we are we see the direction to heterogeneous memory and heterogeneous storage, and in principle, CXL is the, um, is the interconnect protocol to tie all of this together. Uh, and pretty important thing is that it maintains, uh, pretty important feature, it, ma it maintains memory coherence between the processor memory space uh, and the memory on the attached devices. And the biggest benefit is that it enables pooling of resources uh, so that it provides higher performance and lowers the, uh, the cost eventually. So, which means that the, the usual memory hierarchy uh, pyramid now looks somehow like this. Of course, um, on-chip memory is always the fastest and the most expensive registers and caches. Then we have main memory, and CXL memory basically bridges the gap between uh, main memory and NVMs, uh, at least in, the, in its first form, uh, as we see it now. But in fact, behind CXL, we could even have uh, all sorts of different memory technologies. So like the green box here, it could, behind it, it could be TDRs, LPDDRs, NVMs, whatever we can imagine. Uh, and of course, different, I mean, now that we start having different memory layers with different characteristics, there are new trade-offs to explore, so we'll need to see how the systems will look like in the end. 
So just to visualize this a bit, uh, in s how server memory w will look like eventually is that, yeah, besides the usual uh, memory controllers on chip uh, for DDR memory, uh, the CPUs are going to have CXL controllers, which basically connect to either memory expansion devices, uh, which were the, uh, the single devices that you're going to talk before, or memory pooling devices, which can be connected to multiple CPUs uh, and allow pooling of resources. So from our perspective, we see our technology uh, integrated in any of these two types of devices. Uh, so basically, behind the CXL controller on the device, uh, we can uh, integrate there and compress all memory that goes onto the CXL device. Uh, either w whether it's uh, an expansion or a pooling device, uh, we see no problem integrating in any of the two. So how it what the how it will look like in the end? Is that, yeah, of course, there's going to be the uh, tier one, the standard DRAM, which we know it doesn't scale. Tier two is what CXL is bringing uh, CXL DRAM, uh, higher, uh, much higher capacity and a bit higher latency. And by integrating uh, compression on the CXL side, we basically see ourselves as a tier three right below CXL DRAM uh, that will increase even further the capacity of the CXL DRAM with a small penalty on the latency side. So how such a solution will look like? Um, in principle, as I said, we are sitting behind the CXL controller on the device side and then our hardware uh, takes care of compressing and decompressing memory pages as they are getting written by the host. Uh, these devices are actually expected to have firmware on them as well and their own uh, microcontrollers and CPUs. Um, and there we expect to have some support uh, on our side in order to, to run the memory management uh, that we need to have. Uh, and eventually, uh, a minimal device driver, uh, that's where we are heading to for the host side. Basically, just to uh, make sure that the compressed memory appears as, a, uh, as an extra tier in the system memory. So how does this memory tiering uh, look like right now? And here I'm... Uh, really, you're going to cover lot, lots of details. It, it became an excellent workshop. Uh, so basically summarizing what Jürgen said, right now uh, in the kernel, the different memory tiers appear as different human nodes. And we already have kernel mechanisms in moving pages across the memory tiers. What we lack is policies. Uh, of course, the situation in Otonyuma is getting improved uh, and now at least there are some basic policies for both cases. Uh, but there, are, uh, there is a lot of work happening on the side of the kernel or on top of the kernel. So, uh, I mean, the basic idea is, uh, is still the same. We need a way to, character to characterize pages as hot or cold or warm or lukewarm, depending on how co complex our system and our hierarchy is. And we see several such systems being developed uh, with both kernel space components and user space components. For example, quite recently, uh, Google published their uh, transparent memory tiering system. Uh, Meta published the transparent page placement. They both try to achieve the same thing, but with a little bit different uh, assumptions, uh, which is basically, yeah, identify hot and cold pages and move them around in the memory tiers. Uh, so from our perspective, compressed memory over CXL is just an additional tier, with one big exception, that our tier has variable size. And 
let me dive a little bit into this. I'm, I'm presenting now a very abstract view of the problem. Uh, it's not exactly how it works on the hardware. Uh, but still, the main idea is that in this example, we have, let's say, four pages written by the CPU. Uh, so we have data in these four page frames. And this is how they the upper array is how they look like uh, to the CPU and the kernel. And to connect with what Jürgen said, I mean, these have some host physical addresses. They are getting written. They reach the CXL. They get decoded to the device physical address and then they are handled to our IOP. Now, after DenseMem compresses them and compacts them, compacts them, sorry, they might look somehow like this, right? And there is free space created in memory, and the question is, how do we use that? How can the kernel understand that there are two more page frames there? Uh, this is a problem we've worked on several contexts for a while now. Uh, for this talk, I'm pulling the rabbit out of the hat, and I'm not going into all sorts of directions that you can uh, go. Um, and bring in DCD into the picture. So the dynamic capacity devices that we heard before, uh, which are defined in CXL 3.0, uh, these actually allow us to have uh, a much wider device physical address space, which does not represent anything necessarily. Uh, there are these dynamic capacity regions, um, and in principle, for each region then, there are the dynamic capacity extents. So an extent is basically a 200 an at least 256 megabyte memory block and multiples of it, I think. Um, which according to the protocol, um, the host can react in such extents being added or being released. So, in fact, um, Jorgen before mentioned the fabric manager which is eventually a set of interfaces. Right now, we don't really know who's going to be the fabric manager and how it will react. But still, the fabric manager is actually the one that could request, give me some more memory here, or get some more memory from there, and so on. From our perspective, we want to utilize this part of the, core of the protocol that has the DCD events which is the events where uh, capacity is added or released, uh, so that we can basically on demand uh, add more memory, the more memory we compress, or remove it if our compression ratio deteriorates. So to summarize, uh, what I mean, if I could uh, w really, what, what I would like you to keep is that, yeah, our goal as a company is to address the memory capacity and memory bandwidth problems. Uh, stateful compression algorithm, which is a big part of our technology, uh, require training and occasional transcoding. And this is an interesting challenge for the kernel because we would like to basically just introduce an API for the accelerator in the kernel and anybody to use it but then we will need access to where the compressed data is, uh, is placed in order to allow uh, continuous transcoding there. Uh, and then in the, in the wider application of the technology, like if we try to use the hardware acceleration uh, for general purpose access into memory, uh, that leads to dynamic memory capacity. And we see a very nice a very reasonable path ahead uh, in the CXL use case through the DCD. But the question is, it could even be a much bigger challenge uh, if we are talking about applying this into tier one memory. Uh, just to show a little bit the direction that we are heading uh, for the future as well. And 
uh, obviously we are yeah closely monitoring what's happening in the CXL general mailing list and we plan to uh, be able to start contributing there soon. Yeah, that's all for me. And please <laughs> questions. Uh, this for the super RAM thing. Uh, have you thought about debugging post mortem? You need, you need typically on a, on a mobile device that you you bring the a RAM dump into the system and you do debugging uh, post mortem in a later stage. And that would be very complicated to read out all all states needed for the, the compressed data. Mm -hmm. Do you have any? Uh, that's a good question. So we actually have, uh, the, the state is actually kept in the driver as well. Uh, so it, it could be something that we can easily find in that sense. It's not kept in secret. Uh, what's not down in, out in the open is a way to decompress the data. Uh, I'm, the, I'm being honest right now. To do the post mortem debugging. Yeah, yeah, I, and I understand that. Uh, so in reality, I mean, where we, when we are involved in the process, that's something we can easily solve. Uh, it's it's a good question for us as a company to see if standardization of part of our algorithms could be a path ahead, so that we can open up some implementations. Uh, so yeah, I don't have a good answer now, but I absolutely understand the problem. It's it's a very reasonable question. So I I really fear. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, I I fear for your super RAM thingy. You're fundamentally backing the wrong horse, right? So ZRAM is just the worst hack, well, not the worst, <laughs> but it, it's bad even by Android standards, and that means something, and that's kind of where it shows up, right? So it's pretty, well, it's a block driver that is actually different from all the other block drivers, and, and it doesn't interact with the VM very nice in terms of memory pressure. It doesn't give you the visibility that you mentioned, and it's, really, really problematic in so many ways. And there's another compressed memory thing, and you probably know that, called Z-Swap, which has other problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but the Google data center people, which are weird in their own way, but way smarter than the Android people, but also weird, uh, uh, they're actually trying to work with a lot of community people in overhauling Z-Swap and getting a proper swap abstraction and if you're interested in that product in the long term and aren't betting on CXL attached memory taking it over, I would strongly encourage you to get into that discussion because that would probably give you a much better access to the memory management that you need. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's excellent feedback and thanks for that. Uh, le let me give two comments. Uh, so, in fact, if I go slightly behind, yeah, let's, let's say here. Uh, we are actually not doing anything ZRAM specific. Uh, it's, it's just um, our real interface that we expose in the kernel is the CryptoComp API. Uh, so the same way we expose the, the simple CryptoComp for ZRAM, we can expose a Crypto SComp or ACOMP that can be used yeah. by ZSwap and Vitaly Please correct me if I'm wrong. I, th I think that's the one. Correct, correct. So uh, we're obviously we're, we are obviously driven by our customer projects, right? We are a small company. Uh, but yeah, in, in principle, we, we need some access to the compressed memory allocator, whether that's Z, uh, uh, whether that's ZSMalloc or ZBAD or ZBAD3 or, or anything else. 
Uh, yeah. So I'll, uh, I'll definitely have uh, a closer look if the discussion is set. Thank you. Uh, in, in that diagram, uh, aren't you afraid that the, somebody could use the monitoring as a side channel, side channel attack to know wha how is the data, what is the content of the data, or get a sense of what is the data? So let's say you have a GPG key that you want to uh, get. You just copy-paste it a million times, and then based on the statistics, you might be able to know something about that key. Uh, very good question. Uh, so that's why we don't obviously give, uh, we don't pass raw data and we only pass metadata. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have, I, I, I don't have a good answer in the sense, no, oh no, we haven't proven in any way that we are uh, side attack uh, resilient. Uh, who has? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we, we are definitely aware of this and we try to uh, expose as little information as possible from our metadata, for sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.